lovely people. Welcome to the best fiction books that I read in 2022. Same disclaimer as with my non-fiction video. These are all books that I read in 2022. They are not all 2022 releases. Um, I'm going to go through it in the order that I read them throughout the year because I'm unable to rank things. <laughs> I've got quite a few as well because I'm also unable to cut things down because I just feel enthusiasm for all of them. <laughs> to kick things off with the second book that I read in 2022 in total, and that is Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. I just really, really enjoyed this. This is like a YA um look at Lily who is Chinese American growing up in the 50s during the time of the Red Scare. Um, she is a lesbian and she's sort of coming to realization about her her sexuality. She has like this girl that she's interested in and then she discovers this place called the Telegraph Club which is like a lesbian bar in San Francisco and it's very much about her like finding this place but also um finding a place of belonging but also still being a bit of an outsider because of her her racial identity because this is a, a bar that is full of a lot of like white women like it was exploring a lot of things that Audre Lord Zami also focused on which is a non-fiction autobiography where um Audre Lord was talking about this similar time period where um she had a lot of lesbian friends but she was usually uh, the only black woman there and there was a sense that like oh like our struggles are all the same actually they're not um i also really liked that this one explores like stuff like science fiction um it also like explores some science stuff and um, because lily wants to be involved in nasa she wants to be a computer like one of the people who compute and do sums and stuff like that and that was also just a really fabulous um angle so this was just really great and I really enjoyed it. Uh, another YA book that I liked this one is Fantasy is uh, Dangerous Remedy by Kat Dunn. This is a, um, I say fantasy, it's actually, it's largely I would say like historical fiction, it's just there's a few elements in it which go slightly beyond like the laws of our reality if you will. Um, so I wasn't quite sure how to categorise it but it is set during the French Revolution and I think that is like one of the strongest aspects of this series as I think that Kat, Kat Dunn has just absolutely nailed the historical setting. Like the the chapters are using the French Revolutionary calendar, which is just fabulous. What I really love about this series is, is we're following Camille and this band that she has. And the first book, like I would compare it a little bit to like Six of Crows with like a heist element to it. The second book sort of moves away from that a bit as exploring topics that are more to do with like almost like Frankenstein concepts and that kind of thing. Um, and so we have this like ragtag group. They are largely neutral in the revolutionary struggle. The idea is, is that either side can come to them and ask them to like get someone out of the conciergerie or stuff like this, get them information. And they sort of ha are a neutral figure. But really, as the book series goes on, it's tackling such deliciously complex topics. And it is really exploring like the power of choice when you're in situations where it feels like your choice is so limited your choice is even more powerful like how far do you go for things how far do you go for causes um all of this kind of thing i just feel like it's one of those series which has a fabulous setting i really like the cast of characters and it's actually tackling some really heavy um not heavy heavy but like complex moral issues in it and it's one of those that i like enjoyed it as I read it but as the years gone on it's like stayed with me so much I really need to read the final book in the series absolutely but this was just like a series that really excites me then we have Build Your House Around My Body by Violet Cooper Smith. This is another one which, like, I finished it. I had a great time. I came away and I was like, I'm not 100% sure I've understood everything that's going on in this book, but I've really liked it. And then I've just thought about it so much as time has gone on. This is set in Vietnam. We're, we're essentially our, our main plot point that we start with is um, this Vietnamese American woman called Winnie has come to Vietnam to be like a teacher and she disappears and we're tracing her disappearance and we're trying to figure out what's happened to her and we become aware that she is not the first woman to have disappeared there is um when you go back in time there are other threads where we have a woman who's disappeared and we have we're jumping around through time a lot and all of the chapters are dated 
um, from disappearance. So like 200 years before disappearance or like two weeks after disappearance, that kind of thing. And so we have so many threads coming through this that we're really looking at like some Vietnamese history, but also like there is such, this book haunts me is what it is. There is a theme of haunting that runs throughout this. It is dealing with folktale and superstition and ghosts and all this kind of thing. But also, like, we're tackling, like, Winnie feels so lost even before she goes missing. Like, she is, in some ways, actively trying to lose herself. She feels lost in life. And so she kind of does things that make her fade even more from existence before she actually disappears. And I think that that's such an interesting point to then go from. Um, there are some, a couple of like, uh, like gore, horror, like there's some imagery in this, it's very vivid, but like is, is not always my jam because I am such a visual brain. But this is just one of those novels that I can never sum it up concisely. I always do a terrible job because I'm like, it's doing so much. And for me, it's doing it in such an interesting, atmospheric, evocative kind of way. Like there's so much in this that is about like bodies and power and vengeance and all of this kind of stuff. It is just, I really want to reread this at some point. I think a reread will be really interesting. Um, but it's just one of those that like, atmospherically, tonally delicious, has stayed with me so much. Moving on to some middle grade, we have A Clash of Steel, a Treasure Island remix by C.B. Lee. This is a queer Treasure Island remix. This joins Black Sails in like queer Treasure Island retellings that I adore. It was just wonderful. It's set in 1826. We're in the South China Sea and we are, C.B. Lee is, is sort of interweaving real history and real piracy and that kind of things into this treasure island retelling it's sapphic the 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 senses of place that i had in this were so strong like i felt like her descriptions of place like i felt so rooted in it um this manages to pull together a crew that i just found myself head over heels for i was so attached to all of the crew members um I think it's really effective when someone is riffing off of something that you know, like I have read Treasure Island, I know Treasure Island, and so I know the beats that are to come, but each time they still so emotionally affected me, like knowing what plot beats were to come did not in any way diminish the power that they had. I felt like she built up relationships really well, both like the central sapphic romance that develops I thought was lovely, um, both of these main characters have complex relationships with their mothers and that was something that I really enjoyed the exploration of and then the camaraderie sort of crew member relationships but with your knowledge of Treasure Island the like I don't know I just thought it was a wonderful wonderful retelling um, it was full of action full of like food descriptions that made me so hungry it was just a delight from start to finish another small tiny middle gradey kind of delight is the Wind of the Willows by Kenneth Graham. I adored this. I read this in springtime. Um, and I just, this was just like whimsical and sweet and lovely. Like by all means, not a huge amount happens in this. These are just a series of exploits with like moly and ratty. Like maybe they're gonna go for a walk in the woods and then it snows and they kind of need someone to come and save them. Like it's very low stakes it's very high delight again descriptions of place descriptions of food the just small dramas like Molly realizing how long it's been since he's been home and how cathartic the homecoming is like very very small stakes adventures but I just thought it was lovely <laughs> Moving on to some like literary fiction, I also loved Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Tien. This is one of those like intergenerational family sagas, which I have been exploring in the last few years. I've been getting very into that sort of like genre as a way of like exploring time and place and that kind of thing. So um, our start point from this is in Canada. We have Marie who lives in Canada with her mother. Her father has recently died. Um, and then this... Uh, older teenage girl Ai Ming comes to stay with them who is um her fam her dad was very good friends with uh, Marie's father they've never met before and we then go back 
and we're looking at this family history, it takes a while for you to figure out which figure is Marie's father and which figure is Ai Ming's father. And we're looking very much at like a particular time in Chinese history. This has like the Cultural Revolution happens while this is happening. And it's very much like the ups and downs for this family. But what I found so captivating about this is the role that music has to play. Classical music runs throughout because... Um, one of the girl's fathers is a composer and one is a performer of music. And there are other people in the family who also perform and compose music. And like the importance that music has, what happens when music is denied you, but the way that you can still keep music with you, even when you cannot actively like play and perform and all that kind of thing, just the the love of music that run throughout this, I just found so affecting. I have gone and listened to so much of the classical pieces that are mentioned in this um it has there are just particular scenes in this novel that really stay with me it's also really looking at like loss uh you know you can like see from this cover like there is a void here and uh the loss of losing people and then the realization sometimes when people are gone like of all this experiences that they had that you didn't know about and then how that makes you then feel disconnected from this person and so many topics like that um I think it was written beautifully and it's one of those that I really want to go and find more of Madeleine Tien's work and explore it because this has intrigued me about her as a writer to move on to a short story collection, I also loved Exhalation by Ted Chiang. Ted Chiang is a really fabulous, like, science fiction, speculative fiction writer. Um, his short story is the basis for the film Arrival. Um, I read Stories of Your Lives and Others, I believe, in 2021, and so then I read Exhalation this year. One thing I adore about him is he has the most interesting concepts, and they are very rooted in scientific principles, real things that exist. A lot of them are just like taking ideas and then going further with them in that way that is so fascinating because not only do you get to see this like thought experiment play out in front of you but it also then makes you think about its actual real real element and exhalation right at the end has um a little end bit where it tells you what the inspiration for each short story was um he just he has such a fascinating mind he comes up with these concepts he explores them and I just I feel like I will read anything he writes because I will I will be guaranteed that I will never have read anything like it after that is Island of Shattered Dreams by Chantelle Spitz I cannot remember the name of the translator off the top of my head but I will put it in the description down below um this is the first novel published by an indigenous Tahitian writer it is very much we are following three generations of this one family and it's giving us Tahitian and Polynesian history interspersed with sort of this forbidden love story that these people have. Um, it's one of those where I would say the language is really quite sparse at times, but I still think it's very beautifully written. It is not overly flowery. And I would say you're, you're not super rooted in character. Like a lot of the time the characters felt a bit like vessels that we're using to explore the story of place and the story of these people as a whole, rather than necessarily like being characters that you become hugely emotionally attached to. Um, I just thought it was one of those ones that's really interesting to read in translation because in, in the original, she is doing a lot with um, use of language because uh, when she uses French and what types of language she uses and that kind of thing, which I didn't have the experience of reading because I'm reading it in translation. Um, but I just thought it was beautiful it really explores a period of history that I actually didn't really know anything about so I'm really looking to educate myself more with some non-fiction maybe in 2023 to continue reading about Tahitian history and Polynesian history it's looking a lot at like um the French government specifically like Charles de Gaulle's government um building this like uh weapons base and how that affects like the local community and that kind of thing I just thought it was Again, one of those other things where it's like kind of unlike anything I've read before and I really, really enjoyed it. To go back to some science fiction, I also read and loved The Vanished Birds by Simon Jimenez. Um, God, this is taking all of my buzzwords. It's like found family in space, deeply queer. Um, we are, we open with this child who has somehow been abandoned on this planet. There is something that is different about this child and this crew of this ship um, there are two methods of like 
travel, space travel. There's one that is just like normal, and then there's one where you can move a lot quicker through distance, but time passes outside of you much faster. So they're on like one of these runs, and they end up taking this child in, and it just kind of follows from there. This book like tore out my heart. <laughs> like queer found family through the roof. But also I loved this is like a book of survivors. All of the characters in this have gone through so much, but they continue to it's just like that depth of characterization I got so sucked in by. The bonds that form between people got me. And a lot of these like sci-fi concepts in this I just really, really enjoyed. I know that Simon Jimenez has another book coming out and I really want to get my hands on it in 2023 and read it because I feel like there's a potential here for like a new favourite author of all time. After that is someone who is a favourite author of all time, which is Natasha Pulley. This is The Kingdoms. I love Natasha Pulley's writing. I'll read everything she writes. I still need to read The Half-Life of Valerie Kay, but hopefully that's going to be a 2023 book. This is one of those books that's really hard to describe because there is a premise and then there is stuff that happens that kind of really changes the game, but I can't really tell you about it because I don't want to spoil anything. We follow Joe, who finds himself on a train coming into a station in London and he does not remember anything about his life. This is alternate history as if uh, France won the uh, Napoleonic Wars and as such England is very like everyone speaks French the history of this world is very different and that's a really interesting thing to explore um, we follow Joe as he is trying to discover anything about his life and he receives this postcard from this um, very remote lighthouse in Scotland that is just, it's something along the lines of like, come home if you remember M. And we we follow his journey as he, he goes to discover what this lighthouse is. The twists and turns in this book, the exploration of alternative history, uh, the, the characters there, there is a character in this who so strongly reminds me of um, Captain Flint from Black Sails in that like emotional turmoil that they give you because you're like god that's not a good thing to do but also I understand your characterization deeply and I have emotions uh Natasha Pulley just knows how to get me and this got me so hard this a middle grade that I loved is Leilani of the Distant Sea by Erin and Trada Kelly this is a stunning work of middle grade fiction drawing on a lot of Filipino folklore and these tales are told throughout and they have these beautiful like um there is illustrations and then you get sort of a tale that is like a folkloric tale interspersed throughout the story but they have effect upon the story. We follow Leilani who lives in this little village and essentially like some bad stuff happens and she's blamed for it and so she sets off to go like fix the mistake but no one has ever really survived doing what she is attempting to do and she just like sets off and Things I loved about this, I loved that folkloric element, I loved how storytelling is so baked into this, but also that the storytelling, how it affects the story, is wonderful. There's a real um, look at community in this that I loved, and community as both a force for good and bad, so at its best community is something that binds people together and makes them stronger and means that you can help each other and that kind of thing but sometimes in this community is used for ill and it is used to exclude and it is used to punish and it is used as a divisive thing because if you make communities then you make outsiders and that exploration of, of that harm and that danger was just wonderfully done I just think that this is just a beautiful middle grade story and this is another author who I really want to go and explore more of in 2023. I also loved In the Watchful City by S. Shu Yu Lu. This is a, unlike anything I've ever read before, it's a wonderful explorative piece of science fiction. We follow Anima, who is like an extrasensory human, and what their job is, is to like observe this city the watchful city and keep an eye on everything and deal with any threats and that kind of thing and then one day this mysterious figure comes to him and has this cabinet of curiosities and tells Anima to pick things out and then tells the tales of these items that's that's the summary I'll give you so there is lots of tales within tales in this and tales that link up and tales that relate to stuff um, I just thought it was a really fun piece of sci-fi, like deeply queer, deeply wonderful. Uh, another author who I want to explore further. <laughs> I 
not stop saying that. I'm saying that after every person. A piece of writing that I found deeply moving was Small Beauty by Jia Sheng Wilson Yang. This is following May, who in the wake of losing her cousin, abandons her life in the city to go stay in his cabin. And she's very isolated and she's she's kind of just dealing with grief. Um, she's a trans woman and she's reflecting on these other trans women in her life. And I just found this so utterly beautiful and moving. We cycle around in time. I, that's apparently been a thing that I've been really enjoying this year is novels that cycle around in time. Um, but we cycle around in time. We explore like her community that she has built, her, her loss, her grief. Um, and there's these geese that are doing things. And I just, it's so small. I don't want to tell you any more than that. It was just stunning. It really broke my heart. I thought it was wonderful. A chunker of a novel that I also loved is Wizard of the Crow by Nui Athiongo. I feel like I've talked about this one a lot recently. This is by a Kenyan author. It is like a political satire. It is weaving together so many threads. We are, we are circling around this figure called the Wizard of the Crow, which is this like identity that this guy has made um, to get out of some trouble, essentially. And then it takes on a life of its own. And the Wizard of the Crow becomes this figure that becomes really a part of this movement against the dictatorship in the country. It is a biting look at Western attitudes towards African countries, um, African dictatorships. It is doing so much. The complexity of the women in this I really loved. Um, it's one of those novels that is just so hard to sum up everything it's doing because it's doing a lot. It made me really interested in Anuyu Athiongo as a writer. I want to read a lot more of his work for sure. Um, and I went into it expecting to eke it out across a few months because I was a bit intimidated by the size. I read it in like a week and a half. So I thought it was brilliant. The only piece of poetry that has made it into my top books of 2022 is uh, Wang Wei's poems. Wang Wei is a writer from AD about 699 to 761-ish. Um, I thought these poems were beautiful. A lot of them are very short. Um, a lot of them are very concise. They are to do a lot with... Um, there's a lot of nature poetry in this. Um, essentially, Wang Wei is a Buddhist and there is this tension in his work that is like... Um, moving away from earthly things and trying to reach ascend like transcendence and enlightenment and all of that um but also there's such an appreciation for like the world and nature and like interactions with people and that kind of thing so i feel like there's just this real tension in his work that i really enjoy where his works are both peaceful because we're looking at like the beauty of this particular natural moment and um the joy of like homecoming after being away and all that kind of thing but there's this little tension circuit under running because at the same time, these are earthly things which distract you from spiritual enlightenment and all that kind of thing. And I just found it really, really interesting. I will be returning to these poems. I like to return to poetry from time to time because I feel like one reading of poetry is not usually enough to get like out of it everything that's there. And I don't think that I have got out of these everything that's there, but I'm looking forward to exploring them further for sure. Uh, I also love Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This is following Noemi, who uh, her cousin has married this guy who is part of this very rich family um, and has gone to live with him. And they've got some very worrying communications from her that make them think that she's not 100% okay. So Noemi goes to visit this family to investigate. And what follows is a very classic gothic novel of a crumbling mansion that is quite literally decaying and this family that are definitely horrible and racist and awful in that way but are there other things going on under the surface is her cousin ill is there something genuinely happening there um i love gothic when it has that like the building and the house has is almost like a character of its own and it has its own presence and you can't trust everything you can't trust your own senses how do you know what is real how do you know what is being warped um this has a particular strand that is like mushrooms and fungi and decay which taps into my horrors very well in a way that was very effective for me and I just found myself really gripped by this novel and I really enjoyed it. Penultimately is The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich. The main person that we're following in this is Pixie 
Um, she lives on a North Dakotan reservation. Her sister, who went to the, the nearest city to them, has been lost. She's disappeared and she's missing. And Pixie wants to find her sister. At the same time, we are exploring a real piece of Native American history, which was when the United States government tried to pass this emancipation bill that essentially would have stripped this particular Native American community of their land rights. And we follow this guy who is a night watchman who is based on Louise Erdrich's own grandfather, who is trying to gather support and make a petition and that kind of thing to fight against that. Those are our two main threats, but we also have so many little strands in this. We get other characters' perspectives. We really piece together like a kaleidoscope and we really get a sense of all the different peoples in this community's uh, view on lots of these different things um I just thought it was beautifully written um I really loved this exploration of like community activism and community organizing that was really fantastic um and I just it's another one that I just really enjoyed the telling of and so I'm really interested to see how Louise Erdrich her, how her other works are like that aspect of you know when you really like the way a story is told like how you don't use the same technique every time in each novel and I'm interested to see what other novels are like. The final book I want to talk about is one of the last books that I read this year and I had such a ball with it. This is Mischief Acts by Zoe Gilbert. This is all centering around the idea of Herm the Hunter who is a figure from mythology. He is associated a lot with the Wild Hunt. He is also specifically in this he's associated with the Great North Wood which is this giant forest that used to come down um part of London was originally part of this forest and this is presented as if it is like a research document with lots of examples of Hearn through time in it and so it opens with like a little almost like an academic introduction into the concept of Hearn the Hunter and it closes with a fictitious lecture that is given about Hearn the Hunter and it's like they're short stories but they trace um in Hearn's origin story in this, which is set in the 1400s, it's there is this man called Bear Man who is like a sorcerer who has an element in Hearn becoming this mythical figure rather than a real man. And Hearn has a romance with Bear Man's daughter. And the this triangle of relationship echoes down through time and recurs again and again in these different short stories, in different formations, with different results. And we go from the 1400s, not just to contemporary times, but beyond into this vision of the future. And we are looking at how these bonds uh, manifest itself each time, how they break, how they bond. Um, we are mixing form. Some of these are prose. Some of these uh, we have we have poems throughout. We have like folk poems throughout, like in between the um, each short story. But some of them are told in verse. Some of them are told in very different styles. Like the one in the 1600s is very much in that style versus the ones that are like in much more contemporary styling. And we just whirl through history and we follow this figure. And Hearn is this figure of like mischief. Um, but also chaos and sometimes chaos is good and sometimes chaos is bad and this like uncontrollable wild thing that changes in each manifestation based on what has happened before it changes him he's not set he is ever changing just like the form is ever changing just like the time period we're in is ever changing and we're telling stories that touch on similar themes but are done in very different ways um this won't work for everyone because some of these forms will definitely not work for everyone and um, all that kind of thing. But I loved this. I found it so atmospheric. I found it so evocative. Um, it made me, I, I just, I am a bit of a kaleidoscopic reader. I like to read lots of different genres and forms and that kind of thing. And so I think this worked particularly well for me because I loved the delight of whirling through time and space and going from this one is told in verse and now this one is told in a very like 16th century style of writing and then this one is told in a completely different style and all of that just works so well for me and we're exploring folktale and myth which is my things we've got a focus on the environment and our impact on the world and messaging about the future and I just think it's fantastic I had a really great time I wasn't expecting to love it as much as I did um that is everything this feels like a bit of a mammoth but that is testament to how many great books I read in 2022 I would love to hear if you have read any of these I'd really love to hear your thoughts otherwise if you would like to recommend me your favorite fiction books of 2022 I would adore that thank you 
Uh, I am hoping to do so many more delights this year. That's what I hope for. Every time I buy a book, I hope that it will be a new favourite and it will appear in this video next this time next year. Um, but yeah, I'm feeling very rejuvenated with my reading actually going into 2023. And I'm hoping to have some real delights this year. Um, I hope that you have had a very lovely reading year. And if not, I hope that this year is even better for you. I will see you next time for something different.